Since Peter Obi, former Anambra State Governor, declared his intention to run for president in the 2023 general election in Nigeria. The peace-loving, soft-spoken gentleman has visited the six geopolitical zones of the country to converse for support amid challenges of insecurity, inflation, and religious crisis, just to mention a few. During his nationwide delegates campaign tour, the former presidential running mate to Alaji Atiku Abubakar in the 2019 general election stated that he only needs four years to fix Nigeria. Obi said he will replace the sharing formula of monthly allocation with a production formula if elected. He further stated that Nigeria has been badly managed over the years and the country is collapsing. In a meeting with PDP delegates in Kaduna State, Peter Obi promises to turn Nigeria into a producing nation that is less development on oil. Joining us in yesterday. Since his tour across the Federation soliciting delegate support, presidential hopeful Peter Obi has visited 34 states. While speaking to party delegates in Kaduna, Obi laments the state of insecurity, surging unemployment rates, and the over 15 million out of school children in Nigeria. He tells delegates that it's time to rebuild Nigeria, taking the nation from its consumption status to a production based economy. Well, about the Angelic government, we were owing just 3 trillion, today we are owing 58 trillion. And Nigerians don't care. Nobody cares, yeah. Everybody thinks they see something to share. People of Kaduna, all I came today to tell is that whatever we are sharing is finished. We must not build. We must not go back into productivity. All that my all that government, all that I can do is to invest in our youth. We have youth who are energetic, we have youth who are hardworking, we will invest in them to be productive. Peter Obi's campaign director general describes him as a man with the requisite experience to fix Nigeria's economy. Meanwhile, the Kaduna State PDP chairman says it's time for the northern region to use their voting strength to elect persons with a performing track record. When we are waiting for voting, Yes, let's see, because now still we are not going to talk about voting a northerner or a southerner. We are going to talk about voting a Nigerian, a capable Nigerian. Whether it is APC or PDP, no presidential aspirant to date has the same qualification or can rank close to what Peter will be asked, not one. So when you elect him as the PDP candidate, you are choosing the best of the very best. Obi decries the moribund states of the Kaduna textile industry, which used to pride itself as one of the largest textile industries in West Africa. He promises to revitalize the textile industry and create jobs for the Timin youths. The money we've borrowed and consumed or thrown away, if we are taking just 10% of it, 5% of it and thrown to the textile industry, Nigeria would have been a different place. We can earn more money from exporting textile and garments than we earn from oil. Oil is just giving us $15 billion. Here, Bangladesh is doing $6 billion from garments, Texas, and Vietnam is doing 32 billion. They are more than oil, so we can do more. All you need to do is to remove Nigeria from consumption to production. I know how to do it. I'm a world creator. Peter Obi, the presidential hopeful, is appealing to cardinal delegates to support him get the party's presidential tickets. He says, if elected, he would turn the fortunes of Nigeria around for good. Nisi Gabriel. Arise News, Kaduna. Joining us now is Mr. Peter Obi, former governor of Anambra State and a presidential aspirant on the platform of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP. 
Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Good morning. Ben, for having me. Thank you. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you. Well, before we <coughs> talk about your tour of uh, the 36 states of the Federation, let's talk about the uh, major uh, incident that everyone has been worried about, the ugly news of the murder of Deborah Samuel, uh, a student of uh, Shiwu Shagare Sokoto College of Education, and the attendant uprising that followed that. What are your comments on this uh, ugly incident? It seems to be well, uh, causing so much uh, sadness. Ruben, for me, the first thing is to most sincerely condole the family on this very sad incident. That incident diminishes our society, diminishes Nigeria as a country. It shows how fragile our cohesion is, how fragile people do not obey or respect our constitution and our loving living as a society. Because we have a constitution that guarantees us freedom of worship, free speech, everything, and that people should not take laws into their hand, no matter how aggrieved or offended or anything you feel. So for me, it is a very sad situation that should not be in today's society. And it's one of the things why I'm, whenever I'm campaigning around, I keep saying, I will work hard to build a Nigeria where people will have respect for law and order, love each other, work hard to ensure that our cohesion gets better. Because what is this? It hits our intangible assets, our contribution to our growth. So for me, very sad situation. I know so many bodies have been taking on the issue seriously the way it should be. Right. So to go back to what you first said, Dr. Abati, you just completed your tour of the 36 states of the nation, and it's believed that you're the first aspirant to do that in either APC or PDP. I want to know what informed that plan. Why did you decide to tour each state individually? How did the delegates receive you? And what were the problems that you observed around the country and how you intend to fix them? Well, I've actually toured 36 states. So it should be easy. It's normal that this is plus one. There's only one I haven't gone to. You know, but that is personal to me. You know. But let me tell you why I told, decided to tour this, this, this individually. And I was discussing this with um, somebody that's been close to me recently in terms of even supporting and helping me as I do this tour, Dr. Kube. And I said to him, listen, doctor, as governor, I visited every local government in Anambra State and slept in them. Even when it's a short distance of one hour from Oka. And I said to him, today, if I have opportunity of serving this country, before doing any visit outside this country, unless for an inevitable invitation, or somewhere that is, I must go for a meeting, I will first talk at the six days of Nigeria. Stay there, discuss with the stakeholders on ways and means in which we can build a more cohesive, a peaceful, caring society. Look at ways in which we can bring the best of every state. It's critical. The same thing is what I did by going from one state to the other to largely be able to converse and interact with the delegates from that state on why we cannot continue on the path we are today. What does it feel? If I tell you, it's very difficult. 
I find so many things very worrisome. Very, very worrisome. One is that our politics remain very large, largely transactional. Two, which is very sad, most worrisome to me, is that what makes a country, one of the most important ingredients of being a nation is respect, trust, people have for their currency. Currency is a measure of faith and trust of citizens in their nation. Currency is a measure of productivity. Currency is a measure of your economy. I find it very, very worrisome that government officials who are supposed to be protector of this particular item a currency have abandoned the currency and are now spending dollars. I find it worrisome that while our manufacturers, business people cannot find dollars for critical inputs into manufacturing, critical import of spares and everything, the dollar is scarce. But the politicians found money to share. No country of the world would this happen. And this is being shared by people who have no legitimate means of earning dollar ever in their life. So it's a different thing if somebody comes and says, oh, Peter, I invested money in this and I earned uh, half a million dollars. That's what I'm sharing. But that Ruben, whom I know, had not earned any dollars in the past Five years. He's sharing dollars openly. And nobody's questioning that. One, you diminish your currency, you ruin your economy, and everything. I was in Morocco just within the past three weeks. I bought travel allowance from Nigeria. And I went to Morocco, met people, and I said, they told me that this dollar, I have to cash it through using my credit card. So I said, where is dollar credit, uh, where is dollar credit, um, this point where I can cash my dollar? I was shocked. And they told me, not in Morocco, that I have to change that money in their currency if I want to. And I was in every country. And when I spoke to the government officials, I said, why, why wouldn't you have a place that can cash dollar? He said, not in Morocco. In Morocco, you spend our currency. So you must change that dollar in our currency. In Nigeria, government officials and everybody is changing our own currency into dollar. And this is dollar we cannot give to manufacturers. This is dollar we cannot. Again, if following up to that is that why we cannot pay gratuity pensions of people who have worked hard in this country, while we're owing workers, owing lecturers, we are young ones are not in school, owing teachers in various states of Nigeria, politicians have huge amount of money to share. So it's, there's a disconnect between the entire thing. As, as more as I travel and talk, the more I get more worried. And I look at myself, I've been a governor. I, I went for second term. You know, I went for election through a time I was in office. I can't remember calling people to share the money. But I was, I, whenever I invite them, I show them what is what I'm doing, and this is where I saved your money, the one that is remaining. I've done this road, I've done this, I've done this, and this is where the remaining is. But that today, people are sharing, your own teachers, kids are not in school, the kids don't have this, and, that, and you're sharing money. It is absolutely worrisome. That's my observation. But in any case, I'll continue to go on hoping that somewhere we'll be able to get this issue dealt with. We can't continue this way. No nation can continue this way where you get up in the morning and you're sharing people money for no productivity. 
and the money you're sharing, everybody, everybody is aware that a few years ago, Peter and B, Ruben and Bati, we're sharing money today, have no legitimate means, no office of any such money. So that money, we know where it came from. And nobody's screaming. Nobody's shout. Okay. So, uh, it's just a debacle with Nigeria as everything, you know, we monetize politics and monetize everything. You, you I, I want to pick your parents. You, you constantly talk about moving Nigeria from a sharing to a producing nation. I'd like you to clarify that your position. And, you know, how do we intend to achieve this? I mean, you talked about the textile industry, for instance, in that video. You talked about the fact that we can make more money from textile than we make from crude oil. I mean, how do we do this? How does Nigeria truly make wealth? Because Nigeria is a poor country as we speak today. Very poor. Nigeria is not a poor country. The leadership of Nigeria is poor. You have to remove the... Nigeria is a very rich country, blessed by God, with good weather, with good everything. You know, Nigeria is not poor. What is poor is leadership. When you have poor leadership, you cripple everything, you make everybody poor. Because your thinking is poor, your business is poor. You can remove Nigeria from being a consuming, sharing country to productive country. She just mentioned about my talk. Whenever state I reach, as I land, I look at the first the agricultural, the land, the massive land God gave Nigeria. I look at the people God gave Nigeria. And I ask myself a question. How, can, how did we get here? About that, it's a very simple thing. Nigeria is a country of about 930, I think 31,000 square kilometers of land. 923,000. 923, very good, very good correction. Vietnam is 331. Thousand square kilometers. Nigeria is 200 million population. Vietnam is 100. Vietnam export last year is about 300 billion total export. Nigeria export last year is about 30 billion, 10 percent of Vietnam. So we have a third of their land. We have half of their, we have twice their population. They have a third of our land, half of our population. Look at the productivity. That shows you know they're producing anything. The five or six biggest states in Nigeria, Niger, 76,000 square kilometers, Boronu, about 17, Taraba, 54,000. I think Kaduna, 46. Bauchi, 45. The five biggest or six biggest states in Nigeria is about 340,000 square kilometers. It's bigger than Vietnam. Those six states. And look at what they're doing. And what is Vietnam exporting? Vietnam is exporting manufactured goods, not oil. 98% of their export is manufactured goods. Number one is electronics. You saying it cannot be manufactured in Nigeria? It can. We had Debo Electronics back no, no, in I said it can. We even yeah. went that time was in Vietnam. Are you number two or followed by that is again issues of funds. Number three is Tesla that I mentioned. 32 billion. Kaduna used to be home of textile and garments. Where is it? These three sisters I called you, Kaduna is there. They're not doing that. I said it in Kaduna that we can export even if it's just two billion. They are doing 32 billion. Bangladesh is 36. There's nothing happening in Kaduna. In fact, you can't travel to Karuna. I wanted to go to Karuna. People said, you can't go to Karuna by road. 
No, no flight goes to Kaduna. No train goes to Kaduna. That I, if I want to go to Kaduna, I have to go to Kanu and drive to Kaduna. What are you talking? Kaduna? Where we have all our meeting instructions and everything. No. Because you've created a country that is not productive. It's simple. So this is just talking about being productive. The fourth or fifth biggest export of Vietnam is footwear, which are back and deliver. I used to do it. 23 billion. More than oil. Just shoes and footwear. What's that? You know, this, this is something that is so simple that you can do. I was in Bangladesh. You see me give example for good one week. Went to the villages, saw women sewing and doing this clothing. They are sporting. And I can tell you, Nigerian women are bright, more hardworking than these women. All we need them to do is to support them, ensure proper government committed grants to them, not to TV show. It is a straightforward thing. I can go on and on and show you why we, to even turn in these states that I mentioned, 340 thousand square kilometers. It's just, Netherlands is just 10% of them. 10%. 333,000 square kilometers. They exported agricultural goods, 120 billion. These six states can't even feed themselves. I was in Taraba. And I was landing in Taraba. I look at the Mam lovely place, the Mambilla area and everything. You can grow coffee there. Ethiopia, this is not first world now, exported coffee last year, $905 million. You can go and check it. Ethiopia, this is not for not Colombia now, who have done much more, but Ethiopia, yeah. You can grow flour there. Kenya did flour. Almost half a billion last year, flour export. In fact, young girls, non-graduates that pick flour in Kenya are paid between $100 and $150, which is about 100000 now. A minimum wage is starting. These are countries in Africa. Morocco did an agricultural export of about 10 billion. What is Nigeria doing? We're just waiting to share the soil money. That's what we are sharing. Even when we share it, we politicians cut it away and using it to buy people as if they are goats and everything, rather than encourage them. And them. So you can turn it around. How do you do it? Most of these corporations you see across all these countries are driven by small businesses which are dominated by the youth. And we have large of them, very initiative, very entrepreneurial, very... You see all these boys, they even call Yahoo Yahoo boys. That's how India started. They were doing Yahoo 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 until a leader came and turned them around. They turned that the same thing they were using to defraud people into a, what became today that India dominates the ICT. That shows the talent is there. What they need is direction, somebody that will pull them in the right direction, support them, small businesses. Small businesses have died here. That's what is driven. Service industry contributes 41% of GDP of Vietnam. And what is happening there is all SMEs doing small, small businesses. Our manufacturing today contributes only about 9%, even below that, of our GDP. Not for a developing country. Not for a country of our size. China is 30%. If you go to other countries, you see it, they are above 15%. That shows you don't have power, you don't have anything, you don't have access to it. These are not rocket science. A lot of people say there are structural problems on ground. Oh, so if you say you want to do all this, Without fixing power, for instance, other structural problems, how do you get it done? That's what I'm saying. You fixing power is not rocket science. Let people not talk about this thing. You see, we got it wrong from the first privatization and other things and everything. Well, because you, you must have a commitment that you're going to do this right. What happens in this Nigeria is that, okay, we want to privatize power. We do not look at the... If I study from beginning to end, I know how this is going to... What are we talking about power? 
between 2015 and today, it, Egypt had doubled its power production from 26,000 to 55,000. Egypt, not, Egypt, I mean, if we don't want, I as a, go, a president, who go there and sit there and say, how did you do this? It's not from the moon. It, today, you are the giant of Africa. You're generating 4,000 megawatts, which is what we've generated since the house born. The second biggest economy, South Africa, is doing about 50,000 with 60 million people. The third biggest economy, which is Egypt, is doing 55,000 with 100 million people. Let me tell you, if we want power to change, it will change. The first time we borrowed money to do power here was 1964. You have seen me say it. I went to Tumbo and Tafa Bala. I was going to say, where are you going here, Peter? I said, I came to pay respect to this great man who loves Nigeria, who governed Nigeria. In September 1964, all of you have access to it, Tafa Bala wrote one bank saying, I want to borrow $82 million to, to build Kind Dam 58 years ago. In that letter, he said, to spur economic growth of my country. In the reply from the World Bank, they said, we approve this because it will help in development of your country. If you value $82 million in today's money, it's about $1 billion. So for $1 billion, he had the foresight to build about 1,000 megawatts of electricity. Today, our debt is about $120 billion. Imagine if you threw a third of it to generating power at $1 billion per 1,000. We would have had 40,000 megawatts. This place would have been a manufacturing hub for the entire Africa. Because we have the talent, Newi, Eba, Kanu, everything. I went to Kanu. All the industries are dead. So what you have now is that you have millions of people who are begging. I went to Onicha, same thing. I went to Aba, same thing. These are people who are industrious, who wants to work, who are willing to go back. So you can change it by borrowing the same money and throwing it in the, in the right direction, not borrowing it for sharing or for anything of anybody to talk. So it's very easy. We can change it. Okay. <clears throat> well, all this about productivity and making Nigeria competitive, I guess we can't do it without strong human capital. Completely. With capacity. Yes. And only the other day, the uh, chief uh, of the field office of UNICEF in Kano was saying that the number of out-of-school children in Nigeria is now about 18.5 million. Out of that figure, the same figure that used to be 10.5, at one point we were told it was 13 million. Out of that 18.5 million, 60% are girls, the girl child. And these 60%, most of them, are in one part of the country, the northern part of the country. Now, how do you intend to tackle this issue of education in the country to ensure that we have a competitive you know, uh, group that can take Nigeria forward and ensure this productivity that we've been talking about? Ruben, I've always said that my number one priority is education. Number two is education. Number three is education because the more educated your country is, and it's been shown, the better your economy. Because you can't talk about productivity, you can't talk about it without investing in education. And it's very simple, especially in education of women. You can't talk of any country that is doing well today without talking about education of women. Because actually, they are more organizers. They're better in terms of being product productive. It ensures that women are actually more productive than men. I'm talking about cotton industry in Bangladesh. It's 60% dominated by women. It was then in Vietnam. And you can go on and on. You know, Japan is a question of government understanding 
this is where we're going to go. We're talking about investment in education. For example, one of the places even Central Bank was trying to dash it for money, if you bring this, that's why remittances. We have 5 million Nigerians living outside this country, and they are remitting about 15 to 20 billion dollars. Imagine if you educate, say, 15 million, you can even succeed in putting investment in 10 million of them, and they leave this country. And that's what it means. We hit 50. That's what Philippines is doing. They become a servant of the world. That's what we talk about Singapore, talk about every. It is about education. So you invest in it. There's no way this country can comfortably invest in education. The amount of money we borrowed and the sharing, Ruben today can fund education. I was a governor. When I came in, we had a problem in Anambra State. Our problem was that the boys were not going to school because they wanted to go and trade. They didn't see any value in education. So we had 80% girls in school, 20% boys. When I came in, nobody wanted to talk about education. Of course, we're lagging. We're number 26, 27. I even saw Governor Mackinde the other day in one of his achievements. He said he has moved on your from 26 to number 11. Because I remember very well, that time, Anambra used to be 26, when it used to be this. And I said to myself, it can't be. We can change this. We will invest in education. But what we did was simple. We put in the resources direct to the school. And it worked. We moved from 26, number one, 2011, 2012, 2013. Today we have the highest cutoff point. You can change it anywhere. I've been to schools everywhere in the world. If you ask one of Tambowal, I visited Sokoto once. said, where are you going to? I said, I'm going to schools. I went to schools in the border. I went to schools, about four schools in Sokoto, Bishop Kuka Hotel, and you could see people who wants to learn. But why are they not doing that? Because we have refused to invest. Ruben, let me even tell you, what we are going today in terms of criminality, our children will refuse to invest and educate yesterday. They become a problem for us today. And the earlier we start educating the ones that are coming now, the better. So we will do that. And there's resources to that. All this money you see that's being budgeted for education and everything, never get to schools, never get, they don't get to where they should be. What we are going to do now is have a policy. We cannot, Nigeria cannot be, look at what World Bank said, it has said that we are seven worst country in human development. Nigeria, this is a country that used to be exemplary. People used to come from, when I was in Nsoka, we had exchange students from America, from everywhere. People used to come to Ibado to learn, to do this. So what is happening? We now go to Ghana. We now go to this. It will change. I wish the I can. I have now become 161 over 185. It cannot be because we are country. We have the resources. People will tell you we don't have the resources. Where did we put the one we borrowed? Speaking of which, J.P. Morgan has removed Nigeria from its Emerging Markets Index, and it's feared that other banks may follow suit. So speaking of borrowing, our debt level is already high. Are we going to have problems securing funding? Will we be able to actually borrow? Well, not if you're borrowing for a good reason. Yes, we have a problem. We were delisted because they said the reason. If I, when I heard it, I told my, I called my colleagues, I have contacts in the, in the London, in the, in the city of London, you know, and I go have contacts in New York and everything. When I called, I was surprised. They, what they said was simple, that you are the only non, you are the only oil producing country that no, did not pay in one dollar in your account between January and March. And of course, price of oil moved from 50 something, price doubled. Ordinarily, my sister, the price of a product you're selling doubled. I expect you to come in with more money if I'm a banker. But uh, all of a sudden, you didn't pay anything. And when they investigated, 
they found out that this money is going to things ordinarily. Maybe subsidy. There's no way a budget of subsidy for one year should be bigger than a budget of health for five years, a budget of education for five years. That shows there's something wrong. What are we substituting? Let's, let's discuss it. Well, it's time to sit down and say that this criminality associated with subsidy must stop. We have a country. We do things here without conscience. Even, in, even, even among the worst corrupt and stealing country, there will be conscience. People do ask me. And I say to them, hey, wait a minute. I'm not, and I did not take an Amber State money. But even if I did, for the fact that I left 75, if I had taken five, I did this conscience. But for the Are fact, no way. I don't, I say it any day, oh. any time. Capital, no. Go and show me one. And I challenge anybody. Show me in the eight, eight years of P2P being governor where an Amber State money was mismanaged. Challenge anybody. And that's what I tell people. Do not bother about how my private life or this. There's so many things I can do to make money. I'm a great creator any day, any time. Whether here, in the Western world, anywhere. Because there's so much opportunity in life. But I'm saying that even if you are, you should have conscience. You should say, no, this is wrong. This is right. So where is the money? So they delisted us because we didn't save any money. But that doesn't, will not stop us from borrowing. People say our debt to GDP is low. It's low. Compared to, say, Egypt or Morocco or anything. But see the difference. If Morocco issues a bond today, Morocco issues a bond today, say, for $10 billion, the interest rate will not be more than 3%. So Morocco will need to pay out only $300 million. Because they have an economy that is stable. Their position is overweight, which is what JP Morgan is saying. So they have a saving. If Nigeria issues the same bond, they will pay 10%. So because you're not in borrowing and doing the right thing, you've lost seven hundred thousand dollars, seven hundred million dollars, for the same amount another African country borrowed. Because Morocco have been able to build their intangible assets to where they are stable. There's peace, there's unity, there's law and order. But you can't do it. It's not the same thing in Nigeria. So. That differential you're wasting in your borrowing, which is what is happening even in the one we're owing now. Let's say we're owing $100 billion. So you are now paying $100 billion at 3% would have cost us $3 billion. $100 billion. $3 billion. To start. But you're now paying 10 So you're losing $7 billion. If you had to $7 billion into education, health, fighting poverty annually. In five years, you have a difference. So you need to build that where you have that intangible asset that gives you that state. That's what Nigeria used to be. But you threw all that away. We, yes, other countries in Africa like Ghana have, have physical issues, but we shouldn't because we have some assets that we can utilize. Okay. I want to talk about institutionalized corruption. The fact that corruption has become institutional. Almost no ministry or MDA is removed from corruption. We're talking about this morning the story of the Accountant General of the Federation. And shocking enough, the last Accountant General of the Federation who had corruption allegations. So in a country where the two back-to-back -back Accountant Generals of the Federation have had corruption allegations, it's an indication that the country like I said this morning, 
is already building a bacterial culture of corruption. What would you do to tackle institutional corruption across MDAs and across every strata of government and governance? That same corruption that makes people that have not done anything in five years be spending dollar like they are spending naira. My brother, let me tell you. And what I'm, I'm going to say will not be different from what I said in the past. First is that corruption kills three things the country needs to succeed. Corruption kills entrepreneurship. Nobody thinks in a corrupt country. You don't build all small businesses and everything. Corruption kills professionalism. You can't get professors doing research when counselors earn more money. Like I keep saying, you see a place where a House of Assembly member is dashing away cars that lecturers can buy. And they say it's doing well. We, we, it's supposed to be a lawmaker, but it's dashing away cars. And they say it's doing well. You have a situation where, you know, corruption case hard work. And you could see it. There's no country in the world, for example, where we pay the amount of money we pay now to buy a literal form. America, a country where we learn the so-called system of government we are practicing with a GDP today of $20 trillion. How many times our GDP? Didn't see. We are not, Nigeria is only about 2% of American GDP. The biggest state in America, everybody knows, is California with 3.3 trillion GDP, eight times Nigeria. If you want to contest government there, you can't pay more than, and just the filing fee, maximum for 4,000 something dollars, maximum. And you have to show proof where you got the money from. Then in Nigeria, you pay $100,000. And this is just to be governed. $240,000, even in the APC. No, no, this is to be president. Mm -hmm. And I ask, none of us paying this, none of us, have anybody asked, can you show us your task clearance to show evidence of any such income in the past 10 years? You know, I've, I've filed for something in the UK. You just put it, and that's it. If I put my mail here, I show you, they didn't know, I've left UK several years, they still invite me for the Queen's dinner, for the Prime Minister, for small businesses, to encourage small businesses. Nobody invites you here, nobody cares here. How can you have your best to contest this election if they have, are you saying that somebody We'll just give you $250,000 and go home and sleep. No. I didn't pay that to be governor. What I paid Abga when I became governor was not more than maybe one or two million naira. So, what is all this? And where are we getting this money that we're paying when we have no money to pay teachers, to pay pensioners, to pay lecturers? And look at the number. If you hadn't stopped it now, maybe Ruben would have joined and paid his own. You know, so where is the money coming from? And the huge money we're using for this. So corruption is very simple. You can stop it. How? If the principal person, I said it before, is not involved, his family is not involved, his friends, he can contain his friends not to be involved. I govern that I'm not. Yes. Good. And I'll give you an example. No thief sees what he can steal and keep it. I was saving that money. The accountant general knew I was saving the money. The Commission of Finance knew I was saving that money. Everything. And we always compare notes every month. Whenever we receive our money, the accountant general will come to me and say, we have priority. Our number one priority is to pay gratuity, followed by pension, because you can't owe people in their old age when they have less opportunity. So gratuity first, pension, salary, savings, and then we use the other one. That's how we do it. 
I waited for eight years. And they knew, they knew it was happening till today. In appointments, we did the same thing. My housing, the guy who ran my housing authority, Mike Wafo, met doing Okube in our campaign. He said, doing, this man is a good man. Don't he said how? He said, as managing director of housing authority, he didn't appoint me. He was appointed by a previous government when I came in. So I came in. It, we are said, where is the housing authority? He showed me a project he was doing. But to make me feel at home, and show that he brought me a peaceful, a, lot, a piece of land, good land, and some of the properties he wanted me to buy cheaper than whatever. He came to me and I said, Mike, I have nothing to do. What do I need the land for? I'm the person who is supposed to be managing this. I don't sell houses. Please take your houses away. Well, on that note, Mr. Obi, we need to take this short break. And after that break, uh, we'll be right back with you. Please stay with us. Our guest is still Mr. Peter Obi, presidential aspirant on the platform of the People's Democratic Party. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the morning show here on the Arise News Channel. Still with us, our guest is Mr. Peter Obi. I'm a governor of Anambra State and presidential aspirant on the platform of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP. Thank you for staying with us. Um, Thank you, Ben. I was going to ask you about the party primaries. Now, the other week, the uh, Inter-Party Advisory Council approached INEC and asked INEC to postpone uh, the primaries or to give an extension of time for up to two months. And INEC said, no, it's not going to shift because there will be uncertainty, there will be distortions, other activities will be affected. Now, only yesterday again, you know, INEC has expressed concern that three weeks to the deadline for primaries, the political parties are not uh, organizing their primaries, they're not holding the primaries. Instead, the PDP shifted from May 21 to May 25. The APC also shifted uh, by a few days. Most of the other political parties they all, most of the primaries are scheduled for between June 1. Some are even holding their primaries on June 3rd, the last day for the submission of the list of uh, 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 candidates. Uh, why is this the case? Uh, do you think that uh, they are trying to blackmail INEC into uh, offering an extension? And why is everybody waiting till the last minute uh, with a timetable that had been announced long ago? Quite frankly, Ruben, for me, I also think that the time, yes, it's been announced a long time ago, but I also think that the time is too short, personally. The reason is that the, the primary stage is, should be allowed to be a bit longer in order for people to scrutinize all of us who are aspiring. If you follow, I don't know very well, but if you follow primaries globally, it tends to be, I believe it's a little bit longer than what we had, or what we are getting now. Because it is important that you have more time, just like we don't do enough of scrutinizing, enough of investigation, enough of interrogation, enough of even debates at the primary stage, which will help to at least, like all these things I'm saying now, when I was governor, they, well, I was not owing gratuity, when I was governor, I was not owing contractor, when I was governor, I was not owing this, I was not doing that, you're saving this money, these, are, these things are things that we should be investigated. Because you now find some of us who have been governors, who have been this, Writing so a, some a glossary, uh, manifestos, even uh, policy documents that is totally at variance with what they've done in the past. Clinton became president of America, which you can say remains the best America president in the recent time because he was one to achieve a balanced budget. That we can remember. 
by what he did in Arkansas. People went and interrogated, verified those things. He was claiming that's how it works. Even Donald Trump was voted because of his business background. So there must be something people can look at and say, hey, wait a minute. Rufai is this, is this. All these things Rufai is saying every morning on TV. Let's go and even look. What is he doing? How does he even live? And everything. You could even go out and find out Rufai have broken the head of his wife and everything. These are investigations. You need to find out. What is this, this man is saying? Is it true? Is it this? No speculation. That's what we need to do. How distracted is this man? Is he going to concentrate himself? So for me, I think. And if you finish the primary, say end of this month, Ruben have eight months to campaign. Again, I think it's a long time. Six months should be ideal. So for me, personally, this primary should be like the request around July, of course, and then follow on. So there's enough time to say, all these things Mr. Obi is claiming. Can we go and investigate? He said he had a business 25 years ago in the UK that is doing a turnover of millions of pounds. Bank gave him this. Let's go and find out. That's why people come in, you know, this Organizations like you come in, they even fly people to say, hey, this is this. So we can say, yes, having verified, you know, what will be saying is this. So it's critical, but when you rush all this with everybody going around, like I said, sharing naira, sharing dollars, sharing all currencies, all manner of currencies, is it, this long time, I say, we'll even say, this campaign funds. Where is it coming from? In America, one of the biggest in the investigate is campaign funding. So you can't just go and share people money. More so when we're damaging our currency. For another country's currency. So these things are things we can look back and say, let's investigate this. Let's target this. This man said he moved education from year to year. This man said people were not going to school. Somebody can go to Anambra and say, let's visit all these schools he's talking. You know, Dennis Memorial Grammar School, CKC, all this. What is it true? This bus is he said he bought for school. Is it true? Did he provide the computer? Go to Xenox computer and said, this man said, HP, in Lagos, yeah. This man said he bought you 30,000 computers. That is the biggest in Africa. Is it true? This is why that long period. Now when the person becomes a candidate, we are not left with two choices of bad and worse. Everybody starts scrambling. Maybe, okay, Rufai. But Rufai is better than uh, Ruben. Or oh, Rufai is better than Peter. But if, if you check it, they are the same thing. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Peter B. That's all we'll be able to take uh, today. I'm sure we'll have another I opportunity. Sister, I have a question. I so. to yeah, well, but we've run out of time. Oh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Maybe you... All right. Thank you very much for your time.